Good to go. <clears throat> All right, so we will talk about the electrical system and the fuel system as well. Primary source of electrical power in the T6 is the starter generator. 28 volt, 300 amp. It operates all the battery bus and generator bus equipment through the bus tie, which I've got kind of drawn up there. And I'll reference that here from time to time. It also gives a trickle charge to both batteries, the aux battery and the battery as well. So it provides all the power that we need for the aircraft. The generator control unit is on the right-hand side in the aft cockpit. Before going any further, remember the battery switch is on the left and the generator switch is on the right. It spells out the acronym Brigadier General, BG. Battery stuff is on the left-hand side of the cockpit. Generator stuff is on the right-hand side of the cockpit. This is how it's designed. So whenever you get confused, Look at the little piece of paper that's the cockpit and the accompanying side panels and know that the switch positions tell you what side the battery stuff is on and the generator components. But the generator control unit would make sense. It's on the right-hand side, but it's in the aft cockpit because that panel, there's nothing under there except for the GCU. The front cockpit's pretty full of things underneath the side panels. Generator and battery switches are electrically held in place. Only one of the switches can be operated at any time. Generally, the person sitting in the front cockpit turns on the battery, turns on the generator when it's appropriate per the checklist. So what you're gonna see in the rear cockpit is the battery and generator switches are off. If I in the rear cockpit need to take control for whatever reason, I engage my battery or generator switch, the front cockpits turn off. It's just electrically magnetic held in place. They both can't be on at the same time. The system won't allow it. Generally, the front cockpit controls all of the switches. Distribution-wise, we've got a similar layout for both the battery bus and its components and the generator bus and its components. The generator powers up the forward generator bus, which, which in turn powers up the aft generator bus and the appropriate avionics buses. So all the power for the aft comes from the forward buses. That layout is similar to the battery side. It just mirrors it. So all the battery bus forward components power the aft components as well. That's where it gets its power from. Hot battery bus on your walk around in the aircraft, you guys saw the circuit breaker panel that was right above the battery on the uh, left-hand side of the aircraft. So there was a battery, and then there was a small circuit breaker panel up there. Those items are the items on the hot battery bus. It would make sense that the clock or the ELT or the battery switch, which is electrically held in place, all are wired directly to the battery. Your car has the same kind of stuff. It'd be a pain in the butt every time you jumped in your car, you'd have to reset your clock. So there's certain things that are hooked directly to the hot battery bus. One note in particular, the emergency flaps. So in the event that you lose the generator and or battery bus, and you need to get your flaps down, that DC operated flap lever is wired directly to the battery. So if the battery has any power, your emergency flaps will work. And we'll come back to that when we talk about the hydraulic section tomorrow. This is what I have drawn up on the board. This is basically the configuration of the T6 electrical system. You've got the generator supplying all of the power for the generator bus, battery bus, through the bus tie, and back up to the battery. So all of this is being powered by the generator. If I was to isolate the system, i.e. open the bus tie, oops, what did I do? There we go. That's a little bit better. If I was to put that to the open position, what would be the result? 
What's going to happen to my electrical system? Am I going to lose anything on the T6? You were going to say something. Yeah, exactly. We just split the baby in half. The battery is now responsible for powering all the battery bus components, and the generator is responsible for all the generator bus components. We didn't lose anything other than the charging capability back to the battery, and the battery bus didn't get power from the generator. That's all that does. You're just basically opening up the circuit, and each is responsible for their own bus. So this bus tie allows us to power everything through the generator. Don't want to touch that anymore. Okay. When that when that happens, when you split the bus, how long does that battery last power in its out of place? Okay, good question. That's in the abnormal section. Somebody can answer that? What'd you say? Did you say something? 30 minutes. It lasts 30 minutes. And the aux battery for its components will also last 30 minutes. So we were promised that by the Air Force and the Navy. The avionics components are controlled by the avionics master switch. That powers up our radios, our RMU, our EADI, our EHSI, all of those components through one switch. Notice it powers both battery and generator bus components together. It's the only switch that has both of those connected to it. Circuit breakers. the generator switch, if the front cockpit battery switch is on, the rear cockpit will be off. If the rear cockpit wants to take control and it engages, the front cockpit will turn off. The aux battery is an over center switch. What that means is you can't just flip the switch forward. You have to consciously lift it and place it in the on position. Several switches in the T6 are over center lock, like the PMU. The PMU is an over center switch. You have to physically pull the switch up and bring it forward. You have to consciously make that effort. Most of the switches, though, you can just manipulate like you would any other switch. But the aux battery, in the event that the battery fails, you, pilot, have to consciously turn on the aux battery. It doesn't come on automatically. The aux battery switch is only located in which cockpit? Front, front cockpit. We don't have a switch in the rear cockpit. Aircraft lighting. This will become more evident when you guys do your systems 113 class. Uh, I believe that's Thursday, right? Right before your exam? Thursday, yes. Systems 113. So you can go and look at all the lights in the cockpit and, and what have you. But there are plenty of instrument control lighting stuff, all controlled by the lighting panel located Right here is the light panel. So it's just in front of the PCO. Some of the displays are controlled via the brightness control, like the EHSI and the E, I'm sorry, the EADI and the, and the EHSI. There's a rheostat on the, on the uh, AOA indexer, as well as the GPS. So some of those items can be controlled. Any display that has the little white grommet, you see this white grommet down in the bottom left hand uh, corner like that, those are adjusted automatically. You don't have any adjustment capability. It takes the ambient light and then it sets the brightness based on what's available. So it has that capability as well. Landing and taxi light, those are separate switches for that. You don't have to know that landing's on the left and the taxi's on the right. Just remember where the switches are in the cockpit, that corresponds to the side of the aircraft for that particular light. So landing, taxi, landing's on the left, taxi's on the right, if you're curious at all. The navigation lights, you should have saw that on the walk around. They're nautical in nature, i.e. left is red, right is green, right and green have five letters, red and left run. I don't know, however you want to remember it, that's the, that's the configuration for your navigation or position lights. 
The navigation and position lights are more than just the colored light on the leading edge of the wing. They are the trailing edge lights that you can see right there as well. So there's a position light on the back side. It's just a clear white bulb. The other lights that we have are the anti-collision or strobe lights. There is a diffuser on the wingtip. It kind of looks like some sort of aerodynamic flechette on the outside part of the wing. That's to prevent the pilot from getting blinded by those real bright strobes at night. So they sit out here on the wing and they let's other aircraft know you're, you're new. So these, this is the lighting control panel like I talked about. The floodlights are those that blue glow in the cockpit. The side lights are the ones that are down here. They're the backlighting for your circuit breaker panel and all of your switches down below, as well as the instrument panel on the front, anything that's not controlled by a rheostat or auto. These are all your exterior lights down in this lower region right here. So all of your lighting is controlled by that. Bruce, where did I leave off before? Um, okay. We'll start way in the back. During normal operation while the bus tie is closed, which electrical bus uh, does the generator supply? Uh, well, yeah, when it's in its closed position, the generator supplies both buses and a trickle charge to the battery and aux pad. Any questions on that? Where's the GCU located? It's on the right side of the app. Yep, right side of the cockpit in the app. Generator battery buses are tied together through what switch? Tied. Bus tied. There you go. Redemption. <laughs> the bus tied switch. Power for the aircraft avionics is supplied by which bus? Uh, both from the generator. Yeah. Using the avionics master switch, I turn on the avionics forward and aft avionics buses, as battery buses, as well as the generator buses as well. So both of them. Battery bus circuit breakers are on which side? Left side. Yeah. Private pilot, what side is it? Left side, sir. That's for the Marines. <laughs> All right. Control of battery power is transferable between the cockpits using what? The battery power control switch. Yeah, the battery switch. Could they both be on at the same time? No. <clears throat> True or false, the aux battery will activate automatically upon failure of the primary battery. That's false. Right. We just talked about that. You actually physically have to turn the off screen. The landing and taxi lights are activated by the landing and taxi switches when the gear is what? Down and locked. Yeah, and that's another way you can confirm your gear with a flyby from tower or another aircraft. If the gear down and locked, even though you may not have an unsafe gear, you may have an unsafe gear indication in the cockpit. That's one way to verify if you're landing and testing that sort of thing. But they have to be done. The navigation lights are on the leading edge or what colors? Um, left red, right green. Okay, good. <clears throat> right, any questions on the electric stuff? I know I went through that a little bit quick. You can kind of remember this for the test and kind of cover that up. Okay, what's happening? Oh yeah, generator powers the generator bus, battery powers the battery bus. That type of thing. So, sort of the white position lights on the trailing edge, those are controlled by which switch? Those are the navigation lights. So, they have a colored bulb on the front and a clear bulb or white bulb on the back. Okay, that was easy. I feel like I should have one of those buttons from Home Depot for uh, office snacks. Boom, that was easy. Did everyone have a full lunch? They were kind of tired. Mm -hmm. Rocky. Yeah, the only thing I had was leftover Brussels sprouts and uh, sweet potato. It was terrible. <laughs> My wife's on this keto kick. Obviously, I got no game. All right. So the fuel system, fuel storage. 
primarily stored in the wings. There is a center collector tank that holds how much? 40. 40. 40. Yeah. Thanks. These numbers are important. You probably need to know these. These numbers are usually stuff that the test makers focus on. The one thing that I want to differentiate here is the amount of fuel you can put on the T6. If you use that single point refueling, that little red cover on the left forward uh, panel, the normal refueling panel, then that'll only pump up the fuel to 1100 max. If you use the over the wing or gravity filled uh, ports on both wings, you can add another 50 pounds to both sides because it bypasses the auto shutoff feature. So you can either go 1,100 or 1,200 pounds, depending on what method you use. So remember, gravity fueling is the one that's over the wing, and then the single point refueling is the typical way we refuel the T6. The only time you'd really use the, the um, over the wing is if you're at an out, uh, out location or you're cross country, they don't have one of those uh, single point refuelers, or if you need that extra 100 pounds of fuel, and maybe you should rethink your plan if you need that extra 100. Go ahead. Sir, why can't you defuel uh, after gravity refueling? What do you mean defuel? Like, why, why can't you take it out? Um, why can't you take the fuel out? You can't just have to get out it's through the gravity force. You have to take. You have to use the single point to take the fuel out. Okay. Remember on the gauge, the totalizer, you've got two needles, that 40 pounds is split equally between both ones. All right. If I use a single point, how much can I put on a T6? There you go, 100 pounds of fuel. And this is how it's made. 530, 40, and 530. There he is, hat on the flight line. Anyway, um, <laughs> refueling the T6 using the single point <clears throat> refueling button. It has the auto automatic shutoff feature. It fills both tanks simultaneously. What did I just say? It fills both tanks simultaneously. Okay, you guys all heard it. You guys all said it. <laughs> So funny story, cross country with a brand new faith. I was his bit by piece, so I'm flying with a student and he's flying with a student, but he's playing follow the leader because I had to make sure that he was okay. Anyway, we land at this outbase in Oklahoma and it was kind of a rinky dink little airport. So I asked the guy, hey, have you ever refueled a T6? He's like, yeah, I got this. I'm like, okay, we're gonna go in and grab some lunch and plan our next leg of the mission. So we all went inside. Well, when we came out, the instructor that I was with had left his helmet bag on the ground, which that's probably not a good place for it, but he left it on the ground underneath the wing. And so when Farmer Brown went out there and filled up the T6, it spilled and went right into his helmet bag. <laughs> so now his helmet's not serviceable. So I had to buy a bus ticket for the student and the IP and then I had to call the squadron and they had to send out the dual crew to bring the airplane back. So it was a mess, all because he left his helmet bag underneath the wing. Anyway, I digress. The over the wing refueling method, again, adds another 50 pounds to each wing for a total of 1,200. Which we just said, it's a throwaway. Yeah, over the wing. All right, the fuel system. Let's go through this. It'll take just a second, and obviously it's going to build all of the components associated with the fuel system. So we've got both wing tanks and the center collector tank. What's this thing that's pointing to down here? It's already up here, so it's a throwaway. Okay, boost pump, then what? The manifold. Then the... Which one? Maintenance shutoff valve. Fuel filter. Firewall shutoff handle. Or valve, low, low, low pressure, low high low pressure, pressure, high pressure, high pressure, FMU. FMU. All right, now when it returns, what's this fuel? What's that called? Motor. Obviously, the high pressure pump puts more gas than the engine can use. So this is the purge. 
you got to get rid of some stuff. Purge. Have you seen the movie? It's possible. Okay. The purge line. And then what's this line that comes from the low pressure side back down and pressurizes the transfer line? The motive flow line. So the only real physical pump, like a pump that you would think about, like a sump pump or something like that, something that is a physical pump, is the boost pump. All the rest of the pumps on the T6 are the transfer pumps, the primary jet pump, and the transfer pumps are Venturi. So once the system's running, they just use Venturi flow from the motive flow line to operate. So there's no mechanics in here once it's running. The low pressure and engine, the low pressure engine driven pump and the low pressure or the high pressure engine driven pump are the only pumps, but they're not in the physical tanks. It just uses dynamic pressure from from Mr. Venturi. So it's kind of a, a neat feature. All right, and this is going to build all of the components that we just talked about. So there's the boost pump, the manifold manifold valve, the maintenance shutoff valve fuel filter. That's that red canister that's right there by the refueling port, if you guys remember seeing that. The firewall shutoff valve, you couldn't see that, but we all know where that lever is in the cockpit. It's aft on the left-hand side of the forward cockpit. The low, low pressure engine driven pump, the high pressure pump, and then the FMU, which schedules how much fuel the engine needs through the PMU. The fuel flow transmitter, that data is projected onto the alternate engine data display right here when it says fuel flow. So whatever is coming to the engine is recorded as the fuel flow. The purge line, obviously it would make sense that the high pressure pump can produce more fuel than the engine can burn. Because in high demand fuel states, you could theoretically starve the engine if it wasn't given it all the gas that it make. So it's going to make more than the, the FMU is going to allow through, so that's why the fuel can go back to the center collector. The motor flow line, we talked about that. That gives the pressurization to the transfer pumps that reside in not only the collector tank, but the wing, both wing tanks. The low pressure switch, that activates when what happens? When the motive flow pressure drops below 10 psi, what light do we get in the cockpit associated with that? Fuel, 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 PX. fuel PX. Hey, you could potentially have a problem. Now, what should happen if you get that? Varsity question. Yeah, the boost pump should automatically be commanded on to counteract that, that issue. We're going to talk about that when we get to abnormal problems. The primary jet pump, it is a Venturi type pump. It lives down here in the collector tank. The transfer pumps, there's two in each wing, transfers fuel to the collector tank. The primary jet pump and transfer jet pumps are, low, are operated by what means? Venturi flow. Yeah, Venturi. There's a really good picture. That's Venturi flow. Sir, I don't know what Venturi flow is. Okay, I was a civil, so I kind of know this a little bit. You guys ever water your grass with the uh, insecticide in a canister, where you screw the canister onto the hose and then you cover it with your thumb and you spray the stuff? That's Venturi flow. The hose pressure that's going through pulls the liquid or extracts the liquid in the canister and forces both of them out the end of the hose. That's exactly how it works. So you can see there's no mechanical pump in here. It just operates by differences in pressure. That's why the system is very reliable. Data from the fuel flow transmitters transmitted on what device? Or on what display, sorry. Yeah, the alternate engine data display in the form of the fuel flow. Right down here. Fuel control switches. It's a B-52 co-pilot's dream. There's only three switches. Two of them do pretty much one thing, and there's a boost pump, which normally sits in the arm position. 
So like we talked about with the boost pump being in the arm position, if the if you rapidly retard the PCL towards idle, you may get the boost pump light on momentarily. That's just the PMU saying, hey, something you either, I lost a little bit of pressure there for a second, I'm gonna turn that on. No big deal, that's how the system works. It may even turn on the ignition. Those are just advisory lights. So if it's in the arm position, it's gonna do whatever it needs to do. It normally stays there. Fuel balance and manual reset. The EDM keeps the fuel balanced. If that system fails, you can manually balance the fuel by selecting, hey, I want to balance the fuel myself, manual, and then I select the appropriate tank. Now, if I go manual fuel balance and select left, what have I done? Who knows? But what did I do by going manual and I selected the switch to the left? It stopped your fuel flow from the left side. Exactly. It's stopping the Venturi flow in the left and I'm only burning out of the right. That's all it is. That's all I can do with the fuel system. We just went through the whole thing. Now let's see what the software has to say. There's seven probes in the tank. There's a outer, inner, and middle probe. Sorry. Outer, middle, and inner probe. Excuse me. And then there's one in the collector tank. There are two low level fuel sensors. Those are located here and here. Those are activated when the fuel drops below what PF, what pound? 350. 150. 150 is when the needles turn yellow. 110 is when the sensors are exposed and you'll get the fuel low light on the CWS. And then we already talked about how to read the fuel gauge. How much fuel do I have right now? 800 pounds of fuel. So just take a needle, normally they're balanced, take a needle, double it, and add a hundred, or multiply by hundred. are derived from how many sensors that fuel very good. So you're reading much faster than me. There's seven fuel sensors. How many we won't do that. Alright, so what did I just do in the cockpit? Why is that light on? Uh, you switched the fuel balance switch to the manual reset. Yeah I took it from the auto position where it normally resides and I moved it to the manual reset position. So I just moved the switch from auto to manual reset. It's an advisory light, you're not gonna get a master warning or caution. You're just letting you know, hey, that switch is now in the manual position. You're responsible for maintaining fuel balance. All right, true or false, the weight of the fuel in the collector tanks is included in the total weight on the alternate engine data display. It's true, it's just split between. Yeah, 20 pounds in each one. It's hard to read 20 pounds, I'm not gonna lie, on that, on that gauge. Most of the students go, sir, I got a thousand pounds balance, and it's sitting there at 400, 400. I'm like, well, probably be a little closer to 800, but I get it, it's tough to read. But try, try to do your best. A Little bit of interpolation goes a long way. At least round in the nearest 50, amongst friends. <clears throat> How much fuel? Six, 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 six. Six. Vent lines, typically, we don't really worry about those. Those just prevent overpressure or cavitation and or a vacuum from being created by the suction force of the pumps. The float valves, those are if you're doing aerobatics or doing maneuvers that require G's to go out to the wing tips. That'll keep the fuel from sloshing over. Those will actually close up so you don't spill fuel overboard. So if the, what does the EDM do? I said it already balances fuel, but how accurate does it balance it? 20 pounds, okay. And if it exceeds a certain amount for a certain amount of time, I'm gonna get a fuel, 30 pounds for two minutes, I'm going to get what type of light? 
feel the balance of light. Fuel balance light, very good. So in this case, would we get a fuel balance light? I got 400 on the left, 300 on the right. I'm going to get that because it exceeds that 30 pound threshold. Now, if I was going to fix this imbalance, what would I do? I would go manual fuel balance, and then what would I do? Select the right tank to stop motor flow here and only burn on the left tank to bring that back down. Now, what if I forget? I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten to do anything, unless you ask my wife. If that if I forget to put that switch back and it burns all the way and I ignore the fuel low light, I just ignore it, I don't care, okay? And I burn all of the fuel out of that tank, what's gonna happen? What do you feel? The flight controls? Maybe, you may have to sure to fix it. What's gonna happen when this hits zero? What's gonna happen to my engine? It's gonna start. It's gonna keep running. Because the fuel system is going to switch to gravity feed. I can't mess this up. It's going to start burning out of this tank regardless of any of the positions. It's just going to revert to gravity feed. It will not run itself out of gas. It's not like the 172 you're flying around in and you forgot to switch the tank over and also, oh, I forgot to switch. It doesn't do that. If it really does that, then you're in trouble because you're probably out of gas. And again, manual is available. If the EDM doesn't keep it balanced, we just talked about that. What component keeps fuel from draining out of the wing? Uh, float valve. Correct. The float valve. If the tank loads are out of balance, the auto system stops motor flow to which tank? Uh, the right tank. It's a lighter tank, so. The lighter tank, yeah. That's all the questions. Anyone need a break or can we press? We probably got about another 15 and 20 minutes. Press. Press. press? Well, if you need a break, just. All right, so as mentioned earlier with the previous lesson on the engine system, if you want, you can follow along in the uh, T6 unit develop checklist on that emergencies page. It looks like that. So we're going to be looking at some of the lights, some of the checklist procedures for some of the abnormal stuff. All right. Flying along, and I lose my generator. Generator's gone. What did I lose? Did I lose anything? No. No, I haven't lost a thing. Except I'm no longer charging my battery and aux battery. And if everything is being powered by my battery, Probably not going to last very long. That being said, go ahead. Does the battery last for 30 minutes if it's supplying only the battery bus, or is that battery bus and jet bus? Great question. I was just going to go over that. It's like you can read your third volume. <laughs> no. It won't power everything. It won't power both buses. It'll only power the items on it that it's responsible for okay. for 30 minutes. You're going to have to open the bus tie. The checklist will drive us. <clears throat> so if the generator does drop offline, we should get a generator light. There is a way to reset the generator. On the on the top row, you've got battery switch, ge generator switch, aux battery switch. There's a black button to the right of that. The checklist will direct you to push and hold that for a minimum of one second. I don't think it's connected to anything. It's happened to me twice. It's never worked. So. It's a generator reset switch. It's supposed to bring the generator back online. I don't, I don't know what it does. Okay. Maybe it's a feel good button. Ooh, push, nothing happens. Anyway, follow the checklist. It's going to tell you to use that. Try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you're without generator. Now, the other way you can confirm that your generator is offline is I don't have my usual 28 and about plus two. I have 23 and a discharge out of my battery. Oh. Not only does this light tell me the generator is off, but my volts and amps sure, sure as heck do. So the checklist will eventually drive you to open the bus tie. Okay, so my generator's failed. 
I open the bus tie, now what? This is no longer powered because only the battery is powering the battery bus. I have no power going over there if I open the bus top. So I've shed the whole generator bus, and that's what I wind up with. Okay, it's not the end of the world. I got my standby instruments. I have my ADI, and I can use composite mode to bring my HSI up there. My GPS still works, so I can still navigate. Yeah, I'm in business. My RMU doesn't work, but I can turn on the backup UHF. Control head. So those are some things I can do. If I get a generator bus light, and all I get is the generator bus, but I haven't lost any of those displays, then that CWS circuit breaker isn't working. That's all it's telling me. So I terminate the mission and come back. If, on the other hand, I get that light, these additional lights, and blank displays in the cockpit, it's not the CWS circuit breaker anymore, it's the entire generator bus. And it looks like this. That's what I get. This is generator bus. Ignore the generator light. That's if I lost my entire generator bus. So generator bus, failure, and generator failure with the bus tie open look identical. The only problem with the generator failure with the bus tie open is I got finite amount of time because my battery is draining. If I just have a generator bus, my generator is working, it should be powering everything. Questions? Battery bus. If I just get a battery bus light, what have I lost? The battery bus CWS circuit breakers pop. Not a big deal. Terminate the mission and come back. That's good. I see this battery bus with accompanying other indications. And my cockpit looks like this. Now what do I have? truly have? I got all of those lights on my CWS panel and all these blank displays. I truly have a battery bus for it. So I've lost this. I've lost everything on the battery bus. Okay, my generator's still working. It's charging my battery and my box battery. Remember what I said um, on the first day? This is a DC powered airplane. Notice you lose quite a bit. Normal landing gear extension retraction. I lose all of my capability to change navigation stuff. Yeah, my RMU works, but I can't, I can't manipulate anything on my EHSI. My GPS is dead, okay? So there's a lot of things that are affected on a battery bus and out. It's the least favorite instrument EP for most students. Plus I lose intercom capability and some other things. The checklist is fairly cumbersome. There's four pages to it. This is the old school checklist. We used to carry paper copies. Now we have the ETD. So if you would, you have it handy on the uh, battery bus. Go ahead and touch that battery bus tab. You can see this is the battery bus checklist. If I swipe, these are the notes, warnings, and cautions. If I go back to this page, it shows me my displays. One more page, it shows me everything that's gone. So there's four pages associated with the battery bus failure checklist. Again, not a favorite among students. Big ticket items, boost pump, uh, air start capability, normal landing gear control, nose wheel steering, your EFIS control panel. So there's some big things there that don't work. All right, I'm flying along and I get a bus tie light. I get the yellow master caution and my bus tie is, is not working. What have I lost? That's it. I haven't lost anything. If this is opened up, now the generator is responsible for charging the generator bus and the battery is responsible for the battery bus. I don't want to dilly dally. I only get 30 minutes of useful stuff on my battery bus. So that could be problematic. But I, in effect, I really haven't lost anything other than that charging capability. 
but I should be prepared to potentially lose that battery bus at some point if I can't beat feet and get the aircraft on the ground. That'll be my notification. What else am I going to see? I'm going to get the yellow light and the master caution. Is there any other indication that my bus tie is not working? How about my electrical panel? What's it going to show? Your bolts are going to drop. It's not going to have a charge. Anymore. Yeah, I'm going to be like 23 and change, maybe, or even less. I'm going to have a discharge going on my battery because that triple charge coming from the generator is broken up by the fact that it can't go across that open bus stop. Dang it. If you guys can see this right here, that is the hot battery bus circuit breaker panel up there above the battery. Anyway, battery and generator failure. It's not your day, I don't know. Uncle Sugar was out to get you that day. He gave you a bad airplane. Okay? Your battery and generator don't work. What'd I lose? I lost everything, electrical wise. What do I have to do? Right here, I have to turn on the aux battery. When I turn on the aux battery, what am I powering? All right, I'll give you an easy way to remember it, slough. Standby instruments, their associated lighting, UHF backup control head, fire detection one, SLUF. Standby instruments, the ones that need power, the backlighting for them, the UHF backup control head, and fire detection one. Here's what it looks like. Notice everything's blank, but now I've powered up my standby instruments to include the bank compass, and I have my backup UHF control head, and I have fire one detection. That's all I have. So if you remember back, the aux battery is 24 volt, 5 amp hour. It doesn't have to power up very much stuff. It's got the backup UHF radio, control head, the standby instruments, and fire loop one. There's not much that it's powered. But you got a radio, you've got some basic instruments, maybe you can safely recover here. Alright. Low fuel pressure. We call this the disco ball. What happens? you got some sort of situation that presents itself in the fuel system where the pressure switch senses a drop in pressure. What's commanded on? Below 10 PSI, automatically. You said it before. The boost, Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Sorry. The boost pump. The boost pump's automatically commanded on if the motive flow drops below 10 PSI at the pressure switch. So if pressure repressurizes the line, it goes back up above 10. The, the system goes, huh. That situation is not present anymore. That light goes away. The boost pump goes, well, I don't need to be on. It shuts off. Guess what? If that situation is still present, boom, motor flow drops below 10 PSI, and you get that cycle of lights. It's fun to give this to the students because they'll go, ooh, got a, a, a low fuel pressure. Silence the light. It comes right back on. Silence the light. It comes back on. Silence the, it's like taking a red dot laser pointer and trying to scare your cat across the room. All right, it's the same thing. It's hilarious to watch. Anyway, it's just fun to watch. All right. So these two are cycling. How do we fix it? Just turn the boost pump on and leave it, and then actually eradicate. Fuel imbalance problem. What's the first thing I look at if I see that I've got a fuel imbalance? I look at the gauge, I see a fuel imbalance. Do I start messing with balancing fuel? No, you don't want to start messing with the fuel. You'll want to look at the bottom of the fuel gauge and see if you've got an FP fail. What does FP fail mean? Nope. Fuel probe failure. You might just have a fuel probe failure. Don't move fuel around. The dash one specifically says, 
don't start moving fuel in the T6 or shutting off to try to balance it if you've got a fuel probe failure. It specifically says don't do that. But if there is a fuel imbalance, we get it all the time out here in the ramp because the ramp slopes from north to south. So you'll get in, you'll start doing the checklist, and all of a sudden you'll get a master caution light. You look down, I got a fuel balance. Why? Because all the fuel has migrated to the left tank. So you got 800 or 401 and 580 in the other. So it can be, the light can be extinguished by simply going to auto reset and then back to its normal position. Or manual, back to auto, and it'll reset the logic for two minutes. And hopefully the EDM fixes it in a timely manner. The other way is to do the manual fuel balancing like we've already shown you. Select the light tank, on manual fuel balance and stop mode of flow on the light tank. That'll be the indication in the cockpit. Do not move fuel if you see the fuel probe failure. Fuel probe. That means one of those fuel probes is not working. Doesn't, it's not descriptive as to which one it is. It's just one of them. In this case, it's probably the outer probe that's failed because it dropped to the next level. Remember, the low fuel warning lights will work regardless of the fuel probe. They're an independent system. So if, if the fuel does get down to the point where the, it gets to 110 pounds in that respective tank, then you will get that light. So outer probe, if that fails, it'll drop to the inner probe. If that one fails, it drops to the low, the inner probe, et cetera, et cetera. You're not going to know if you get a collector tank probe failure. You're not going to see that 20 pound jump on the needles. You're just going to see FP fail. You probably won't even know until you look at the FP fail. In. Anytime you get a amber or red CWS light on the switch light panel from your CWS, those will illuminate and you get the oral one. Fuel leaking from the wing, not much you can do about it. You can't shimmy out there. Oh, stop that. Your first clue bug might be the fuel balance. Light might come off. Oh, I got a fuel balance problem. The checklist will drive you down to the point where, hey, investigate for a leak. You look at, oh, my fuel filler cap is loose. The fuel's pouring out of there. That could be a good indication. The fact is, you can't see under the wing, so you may not be able to see fuel that you're trailing. It might be tough to determine that. In any case, you'll want to burn fuel out of the leaking wing be before you lose it. So use it before you lose it. So if it was leaking on the right wing, I'll go manual fuel balance and select the left wing. And you're like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does. I want to isolate the fuel in the tank that isn't leaking and try to burn all that I can out of the one that is. You will have enough lateral stick forces to compensate for a full tank and an empty tank. Dash one says you can fly. You may have to put in some trim. You may have to have a little bit of stick deflection, but you should be able to fly. Where'd I leave off? Fuel balance and unseater will eliminate if the fuel weight difference between the left and right tanks exceeds what for two minutes? How many pounds? Uh, 30 pounds. 30 pounds for two minutes, very good. Remember the EDM? will keep the fuel balance within 20 pounds, provided it's working. True or false, indications of this limiter and our actual bus failure are shown on the enunciator panel. Is this a bus failure or the CWS circuit breaker only? If it was just a circuit breaker, it would just be the battery bus, so it's probably the, it is an actual bus. Illumination of that with all of those other enunciators means that you do have a bus failure. It's gonna be even more obvious when you look in the cockpit and see a bunch of blank displays. 
the boost pump enunciator is cycling on and off, what could be the indication? Uh, look, 10 PSI. 10 PSI in the motor flow line. Correct. Summary. Let's go through the less review questions and I'll get you guys out of here. The generator supplies what voltage to each Okay, it's a 28 volt, 300 amp generator. All the power we need. The anti collision and strobe lights are located where? The wingtips. Correct. Strobe lights have that little cover on the ends as well. External power is on what bus? The battery bus. Correct. Gravity fueling adds how many extra? So, uh, 100 pounds. Perfect. 100 pounds extra. All the way in the back. Generator bus circuit breakers are located on which side of the airplane? Right side. Right side. Right side, private pile. Okay. Full metal jacket. It's a great move. You guys never saw it. Okay. In addition to the indications shown, you have lost all electronic displays except the ADI and AEDD. It's exam failure of what component? What did you lose? Generator bus. Yeah, start up here. Oh, generator bus. Then I got the Christmas tree and blank displays. True or false, single point refueling fills all three tanks sequentially or simultaneously. Which one is it? Simultaneously. Right, because I said simultaneously. You were listening. Redemption number two. <laughs> the control for which shutoff valve is located in the cockpit? The firewall. firewall shutoff handle. What else is it shut off besides fuel? Do you guys know? And? There. Don't care about that. See, it's a system you're not responsible for. That was just extra learning. <laughs> Which enunciator illuminates if the auto balance system has failed or the weight between the right and left exceeds 30 pounds per two minutes? What do you need to get? What are the options? Fuel balance. Yeah, you need to get the fuel balance line, or fuel bow. Which electrical component provides power for engine starts? Battery, primary battery. battery. Very good. All right, 